Thanks. Thank you very much, April. You know, I, I brought a couple extra minds along because it's always good to have some extra expertise. And I don't know how many of you follow amateur sports on the Olympics, but I took a note from my son who went to Hungary last week to do some final training before the Pan Am qualifiers, which are on Friday morning this week. He'll be in Gainesville, uh, Georgia, competing in the single single boat kayak racing and for the spot in the Rio Olympics. And when I asked him, I says, why'd you go all the way to Hungary for nine days to get tuned up for there? He says, well, I got a couple guys in a boat that, paddle, that go along beside me and watch everything I'm doing. I got another guy who analyzes my GPS readings of, of my race. And I go back and I have the physio guy look over my muscles and give me a massage. And I have the sports psychologist talk me through everything. And that just emphasizes how important it is to have a whole bunch of people looking at what you're doing when it's very critical. And there's nothing I think more critical in a business cycle when you're looking to exit and you're trying to say, how can I sell and get out of this business and have enough money to do what I want to do next? So I, with legal counsel and financial planning and an accountant and experts, you'll see how broad the team should be when we get along a little further in the presentation. So just starting with that. I just wondered if, how many, if people realize how many businesses are going to be sold in the next four to ten years. The, head, the front end of the baby boomers is just coming to their 65 to 70 years old. And a lot of them are looking to sell. And the Globe and Mail reported that four trillion dollars worth of wealth is going to transfer in the next five to ten years as the baby boomers are selling off their companies and moving to retirement. So it's a big, huge amount of money. So 70, they say 75% of the companies now operating will be bought and sold in the next 10 years. And there's a good question for you. Are you going to be part of that where you can cash out of your company or are you, call, are you in what we call the owner's trap? I know some of us that are self-employed say, am I really running a company or did I just buy myself a job? You know, as a single consultant, um, really, what I did is bought myself a job by being a single consultant. But if you're running a business, you may want to look at, can you get out of the owner's trap and do something different? If the owner does the selling, offers too many, you offer too broad of a product scale, and the, offers, and the owner is the only one capable of delivering the product, and if the owner is the only one that interfaces with the customers, you probably don't have a sale of a business. Yeah, think of ways you can change it. So we're going to go through eight ideas of how to adjust your company so it does is more saleable. You want to think about how valuable or viable is your company for any of these operations. One is, can you scale it? And by scaling it, can you grow within this market or reproduce it in other markets so it can have higher volume? Or can you sell it? Is your company saleable? And whether you have a company, a business, you may want to think of it separately. If it owns its own real estate, you may want to think of the operating business and the real estate as two different entities. Because you could possibly sell the company and keep them as a tenant in your own property. So different options there. Or some of you may have someone in your family that's looking to take over your company. Can you pass it down? and let them pay you forever? Or would you want to operate as a chairman of the board? Something's beeping. Might be you? Okay. I, I'm sorry because I thought I turned it off. That's okay. This is what I talked about before, is that you need a broad range of people to help you through you know, this change. You need a good lawyer, Gary's one. Mm -hmm. You need an accountant. I'm sure if you're running a business, you probably already have an accountant. It's very important later on, we'll talk about the, how valid are your numbers. It's very important that they're been done by an accountant. What about industry experts? Are there people within your industry that can coach you or mentor you? Family are important. Business coach, and that's the role that I play. I'm a business coach, I'm not an accountant. 
I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a financial planner. I'll show you where my role is as far as coaching your business to a different level before you sell. So the value builder is a way of looking at your business and scoring it in different ways from a seller's perspective to see whether or not it's valuable or not. And depending on your score, the value may be very different. Now you may say, how does this guy come up with all these numbers and how can he validate this? John Warlow, whose, whose material I'm using, I didn't write this material, I didn't create it. John Warlow wrote the book, Built to Sell. And he has researched 17,000 transactions of companies being bought and sold and worked out these evaluations. He knows that there's eight critical key factors for value in a business. And depending on how you score in those, he can likely predict what your saleability or what your value of your company is. The, and we're, the average multiple is 3.76 times net operating profit. And I'm gonna put a word in front of that. It's called normalized net operating profit. Many of you probably independent business owners have been doing accounting to maximize, or I should say minimize taxation. Okay, when you're minimizing taxation, you're also minimizing profitability. When you wanna to look to sell a company, you can no longer be in that frame of mind. You gotta to look to maximize profitability. So it takes some time to change. So if the average score is 3.76 of all the companies that he's researched, what if your score is less than 50, 50 out of 100? You're probably gonna meet a multiple of 2.76. Does everybody understand the multiples and how it works? Suppose your company is making $100,000 in profit in a year, okay? The average multiple would be 3.76 times that $100,000, which means your company is worth $376,000 as an operating entity, not including any asset value that you may have. If it owns the building it's in, that asset value may be a top up, okay? So if your score is less than 50 on the survey I'm gonna go through with you, your, your value would be 2.76 times that 100,000, which would be $276,000. So you're losing $100,000 by not having your company aligned in the right way. If your score is 50 to 60, you could be 3.59 times the multiple or times the net operating profit, and it keeps going up. And if you can position your company so you're at a score of 80 on the survey, you should be getting 6.27 times your net operating profit for the sale of your company. So that's $627,000 rather than $376,000. Quite a difference, I would think. I did a handout for you guys, which shows you what the eight areas are, and we're gonna walk through those quickly and give you some more background. What I want you to recognize that if you'd like to know what your company's score is, all you need to do is let me know, and I'll take you through the survey at no cost. We'll just sit down and do it together, and John's done it. And he's back in today, so you must have learned something on the first time through it. Okay? And also, after you've done the survey, it'll give you a quick response as to what your overall score is. But it'll also generate a very intensive 27-page report, which I'll sit down with you and go through with you again at no cost. And the reason why I'm doing this is I'm hoping that some of you would look to hire me as your business coach to take you through those improvements that you need to do. So it's quite a bit of business development up front that I would do with you if you're interested. So these are all the areas that we're gonna quickly look at. First one is financial performance. Let me just quickly get to it. I'm sorry if I shake a little bit, I have a slight handicap called Parkinson's. So I have a tendency to shake a little bit, so it's not, I'm not overly nervous or anything, just it's a slight disability. 
Okay, and the first driver is financial performance. And that's obviously a big factor. There's going to be two types of buyers out there in the market. And the first one is the financial buyer. Okay, and you know what he's going to be looking for? He's looking for profit. So if you've got a very highly profitable company, you'll be, you'll attract the financial buyer who'd say, I'd like to buy that company and just run it from the sidelines. But they're going to ask you, how reliable are those estimates and projections into the future? And that's where your accountant comes in. A financial buyer is going to be your most critical guy with the numbers. And I'm going to show you, if you have a, if you want to sell on this date, whatever it is, okay, there's a couple critical numbers you got to look at. For the last two years of your accounting cycle, you need to have cleaned up all of your assets within your company. That means take out what you want personally and show that the company can survive on the assets that are left within the company and work. Your accountant will require two years of clean balance sheet in order to make it work. The financial buyer will also want to see three years of financial numbers that he can use to project into the future what the profitability of the company will want to be. So you need three years of good operating statistics. And what do you need to show each of those three years? Profit, yeah. Okay, so if you need a little bit of assistance to get that profitability number up there, this can be anywhere from two to five years to reposition your company so it's highly profitable and properly positioned. Okay, so really it's five to eight years of planning to get to a point where you can sell your company. That means you can't leave here today and say, I'm going to sell my company. Yeah, because it takes some time to get it there. And for those of you who say, well, I'm not going to sell for five years, and I would say, great. That means you've got the time to maximize your earnings, reposition some of the things you do, do some things differently, and make it more profitable. Do you know what the other type of buyer is? The other type of buyer is a strategic buyer. And a strategic buyer isn't that interested in your profitability, but he's more interested in, what do you think? Your market position. Because he says, if I am in Coburg and I want to have a business in Peterborough in the same industry, should I just buy that business in Peterborough? And that's called market entry strategic buyer. He wants to relocate or offer his services in a different town without starting over. So he can say on his business portfolio, operating since 1903. Not that he's owned it since 1903, but that's how old the company is. So sometimes just by having a long history in a community, you have a lot of value because you get them, they can say that on their future business plan. The other thing he may want to do is he may want to dominate the market. Okay, I used to live in Oakville. We all know what Tim Hortons, and Tim Hortons is head office is, is in Oakville. There was in Oakville. Now it's moved to the states. But at one point, they decided they wanted to totally dominate the coffee business in Oakville. They bought up every corner and every location, and knocked country style right out of town. And so they did it as a strategic to dominate the market. Those strategic buyers, do you think they're more fussy about price or less fussy about price than the financials buyers? Less. They look at what they're going to do to their bigger picture because they're buying something for strategy. Okay, so that's financial performance. Both, you know, interesting to both buyers. Growth potential. Anybody will want, want, will want to do a five-year projection where they can take your business, and it all depends on a lot of things that are, can control your growth cycle. What are some of the growth cycle problems that you're going to have? Like rate of economic growth, local, local growth. What's been a very positive thing in our community lately that'll excite perhaps new buyers? 
development, lower unemployment. We went from one of the highest unemployment areas to one of the lowest unemployment areas in a very short period of time. Also, our demographics are interesting because we have the highest number of seniors of any community in Ontario. I, and so if you're in the market to sell to seniors, you would say, hmm, I should be in that market. Okay. Something else you may think of, if you're looking at how to expand your business, you may look at, how can I expand it? What should I do to expand it? And so I'm just going to take you through this little example of a company in England, actually. That was a phot phot photography company that says, how do I expand my business? And they took a look at all the different areas that they were working in, like weddings, and said, how teachable is taking wedding photography, taking wedding pictures? How valuable is it to the people that are doing it? And how repeatable is it? I noticed we got a zero under the repeatable. <laughs> Two or three. <laughs> but unfortunately, what happens between the two to three, most of us are either moved or have aged drastically. I, I was 27 years between my two marriages. So you know, the same photographer is not going to be around. So my brother-in-law did it, my new brother-in-law. So you want to look at how you could rate, what, how, what you could do in order to do something that's different. So this photography company took a look at weddings and said, you know, it is teachable, but it's difficult to be a good wedding photographer. Especially nowadays, we're moving away from wedding photography and doing wedding video. And I think one of the wedding, local wedding video companies came in as a runner-up for the Lion Slayer competition, New Business Ventures in Peterborough here. So baseball teams, how teachable is it? It's very easy, just get them all lined up and away you go. How valuable is it? How many people want a picture of their old baseball team? Some people do, but not, not everybody. And repeatable, it is quite repeatable because you could do it every season. Corporate events, it's teachable. It's valuable to the corporation and it's re reasonably repetitive. Okay, but let's take a look at the last one. School photos. Okay, totally teachable because it's get all the kids into the gymnasium, get them in a group, take their picture, move them along. Valuable. Kids, teachers, parents, all want it done every year. And repeatable, it's repeatable. So the company that went through this exercise end up changing their whole business strategy and just started to focus on school photos. That's all they did. And now they're called school photo business or whatever. So they looked at what products or what areas of the business were available to them and did a simple three-point test and see which would be the best way to look at it. So, school photos. Okay, the Switzerland structure. What's Switzerland famous for other than chocolate? <laughs> like being neutral. Being neutral. Your business should be neutral in relationship to these three main areas. That means you're not totally dependent on key employees because what if they decide to move on, move on to the competition? To suppliers. What about if your company only has one identifiable possible supplier? Is that a good thing or not? And I did some work years ago with a company that wanted to franchise bagels. They want had a bagel store concept and they wanted to do this all over the place. I said, well, where do you get your bagels? Well, we buy them wholesale. And years ago, when Tim Hortons took the lead and stopped baking fresh at every unit, they bake fresh centrally and send things out 80% baked. That's also available for bagels. So they are just buying from a food service supplier these 80% baked off bagels which does, they're, they're tied into one supplier. So that's, that's a critical problem. And what about customers? Is there enough customers or are there only a few customers? If you only have one or two customers that provide 20 or 30% of your business, you may be in a problem as far as value goes. So neutrality is you could separate yourself from any of those elements that you're presently working with and still survive. 
the valuation teeter-totter. Do you know that when someone buys your business, they have to write out two checks? One is to you, and who's the other one to? The government, well? No, that could be, but I'm, there's another key. They have to write a check out to the company as well for working capital, okay? Because when you want to take, you sell the company, you want to reduce the cash there as much as you can, but you have to leave enough working capital in the company so it can operate satisfactorily. That's why this two years of balance sheet information is very important. You can't strip the company of all its assets and sell it and expect anybody to give you value for it. So the, the more someone has to write a check to put money into your account, okay, it drives the, it, the, the cash that goes into the company goes up and the evaluation goes down. So let's say, for example, your company is a company that needs a lot of inventory and you haven't figured out what just-in-time inventory does for your company. So you have all this inventory and it needs, means you need a half a million dollars in the bank to keep refilling the inventory. Well, the guy's gonna say, I can't, that's not good for me. I'd like to see the inventory down at a $100,000 level. So that's what you do during your re-engineering over here in your performance is to adjust how you manage your inventory down so you've got 100,000 in there rather than 500,000. Those are the critical redesign elements that increase the value of your company. So as working capital needs go down, the value goes up. Recurring revenue. Recurring revenue is how much of your business walks in the door without you doing a lot of work. Do you know how much more it costs to bring in a new customer than a current customer? At least five times in marketing costs. So if you already have customers coming in the door that want your businesses, you can generate more income as, very easily. There's a couple different types of reoccurring revenues which are very common. And I'm gonna just, the first one is daily consumables. It's like coffee or Coca-Cola, okay? It's something that people need on a regular basis all through the day. So if you sell a consumable like that, it's good because people can just walk in and buy it. If something they only are gonna buy once in a while, it's not quite as good. So if you have a regular group of people that are walking to your business to buy things all the time, it'll be a higher value. A friend of mine was running a, a health store. And the problem with the health store business that he was running is that he was selling stuff that you would come in and buy once a month, like vitamins and nutritional supplements and that sort of thing. And what I told him, I said, you need some reason for your customers to come in and see you every day. Even just cold juices or something of a daily consumable. And that's what he switched over to, is to put in some coolers and display of food products and beverage products that people could walk in and buy and consume right there. So number six on the list is consumable coffee. Or consumable anything. Excuse the spelling mistake here, right? These aren't my slides. Nespresso, I love their, I love their commercial. Do you like the commercial they have with um, George, is it George Clooney and Danny DeVito? I think it's a great commercial. But this is where people have sunk money into your system and they have an espresso or some other type of coffee maker and they are tied into buying your product. So when I go to the grocery store, I'm only gonna buy one type of coffee pack, the one that fits my machine. So that's number five. Number four is a subscription magazine where you pay for a subscription and they keep mailing it to you. And what do people do all the time on subscription magazines? It's automatic renewal now, eh? They got your credit card so they just recharge you every year. So the subscriptions get, get more costly. The next one is sunk money subscriptions. And that's like Bloomberg. They sell an investment software that you need to buy the computer to run it on with the software and then you need the regular um, subscription to the new information all the time in order to update the numbers that you're working on. So that's another one. 
That's number five. Number two is auto renewable subscriptions. This is Iron Mountain. I believe they're a paper shredding company. So they just say, we're gonna to come to your spot every two months, every month to pick up whatever paper you want shredded. And it's just an automatic renewal. And the number one contract is long-term contracts like iPhones. I don't know how many people have an iPhone that look up their bill and say, what is your balance owing for your phone if you wish to cancel your contract? Have you seen that number in the little upper right corner? <laughs> so you think you got the phone basically for free because you're paying off every month, but unless you keep that, that contract for 27 years or something like that, you don't pay off the phone. <laughs> That's not that bad. Okay. So driver number six, monopoly control. How many people have a monopoly in their business? Anybody? No? Kinda? <laughs> yeah. Your memory clinic, you gotta, you're the only memory clinic in town. So, if you have a monopoly, it gives you a great advantage because that gives you a marketing differentiation. And even if it isn't a monopoly, you wanna to try to differentiate your product as much as possible from other suppliers. And by doing that, you create somewhat of a monopoly within your own niche market, okay? So by having marketing differentiation, it allows you to control price. By controlling price, you get higher margins because the, the guy down the street isn't trying to sell your product for 20% for less. And with higher margins, you get more money for marketing. And so you keep pushing your business and growing your business. Okay. Customer satisfaction. I'm gonna give you a really simple way to analyze your customer satisfaction, which is used by all the big companies. First, you wanna know how many people that you deal with are promoters for your company. And by promoters on your company, is how many people would say yes, buy from them. And you can do that through if you have a, a good network of people on your, that visit your website or you do a customer satisfaction survey, all you have to do is ask them, would you recommend my company to your friends or clients? And this 25% is a relatively normal number of people say, yeah, I'll recommend you, no problem. Then you have the number of passive people that don't want to answer the question. And the number of people that say no. And that gives you your net promoter score of 20%. So you don't worry about the passive people, you take the promoters minus the detractors, and it gives you a promoter score. This is some of the average, or the promoter scores out there for the big companies. You can see Apple is about 72%. Amazon, a little under, under 70. Samsung, a little over 50. But the average is around 15%. So I might give you some idea of how to develop a promoter score. Number eight, Hub and Spoke. What do you think of when you hear the expression hub and spoke? You know, wagon wheel. wagon wheel, yeah. Well, that's exactly what it's like, it's a wagon wheel. I think the best example of a hub and spoke in the industry is the airline business. And you think of, um, in the States, Minneapolis is considered a real hub for quite a few major airlines. And you can get to anywhere from Minneapolis as long as you first can get to Minneapolis. And that works out great for them, except when what happens? When Minneapolis goes down. When Minneapolis goes down, it's a big problem because no one can go anywhere or get to there. So that's the same thing if you're the, the hub of the company, you're the owner, and all the customers and all the employees and all the suppliers have to deal with you it's all good and dandy until you're not there, or until you're sick, or until you're trying to take a week off or a month off. And then that is not that 
good for you anymore. Okay? So the whole idea of this Freedom Seminar is to have the company do for you what you meant it to do in the beginning. It's position it so that you could either scale it to make more profitability, sell it and pull your investment out and do something else, maybe retire or buy a different company, pass it down to your kids and let them pay you forever. Some people like that. You like that, Joe? <laughs> and the other one is to run it as a chairman and not be there all the time. Okay, so that's basically the eight drivers. And let me explain to you a little more about how this process works. As I mentioned to you when I started, if you'd like to go through this in a more detailed corporate perspective for your own company, I would sit down and go through with you. And it takes about 15 to 20 minutes, John, to do the questionnaire. The only number that is really a number that you need to work on is what I would call the normalized net operating profit. And the normalized net operating profit is when you take the net operating profit that you state on your financial statement, then you start adding back in to it your personal stuff that's been inside the company, okay? It may be a draw that, you know, it's your company, you can do what you want with it when you own it. But when you want to sell it, you want to make it look like you, you didn't take any of those advantages. Okay, so it might be the salary for your loser son-in-law. Okay, <laughs> just kidding. Or it might be um, a car that you've been, that's not really used by the business, but it's being paid for by the business. Or it might be your annual conference slash vacation that you take and that isn't really part of the business. And none of those are illegal. They're just the way you run your company. So you need to op you need to add those back in, plus add back in any any draw that you may be taking out as an owner, and take that add that back in too. And the one thing you subtract from that then is the cost of the manager that's going to be required to play, replace what you do. So you need to subtract out the cost of the manager to run the business to do essentially what you are doing. So that gives you your normalized net operating profit, which would become the number that's multiplied times the multipliers that I had before, that the multipliers depending on your score. So that's the only real calculation you need to do to be able to do the survey to see what the numbers would be. All the rest of the questions on the survey, you could pretty well answer off the top of your head with a good enough range that they will be accurate. Okay. Any questions?